Um, we are dealing with the Christ life, the crucified life, and uh, this one's not a difficult one for me because <laughs> this is what I've preached my whole life. Uh, but uh, so I want us to look at some scriptures in John chapter 12. And verse, starting with verse 20. <clears throat> John chapter 12, <clears throat> starting with verse 20. And um, And we'll read 20 down to 33. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came before, therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So, uh, most of us are familiar with these scriptures, <clears throat> but um, to show you that this isn't just totally off the cuff, uh, I'm going to call on some of you to help me reenact this, okay? So let's see, Deb, if you'll come over here, you're, you're gonna be a, a Greek, and I'm gonna be Randy the Greek. Um, let's see, Jason, you come up here on this side, and let's see. Jim, you come up here. You're going to get to be Jesus, okay, for a change. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so Jason, come right here so we can get close to the mic because you're going to be the main character, actually, in this. You are Philip, and Andrew looks invisible, but he's right here, okay? So me and Deb are gonna be the Greeks. Come on up here, let's see, get on this side, and Jim, you get back there. And let's see, let's move a little closer, like this way, Jim. Just close enough where if he turns around, y'all are looking pretty much face to face. You can step back, this isn't the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what I have here, just to make sure y'all can hear what I have here is the detailed instructions of how to do this. Don't read anything in parentheses that's telling you who you are and what you're supposed to do. Um, and, uh, or in, uh, yeah, uh, quote, yeah, parentheses, okay. So we're gonna start with me coming to the disciples, and I'm gonna pass this phone and it'll tell you your part, all right? Sir, we would see Jesus. And go ahead and take it, because you're gonna pass it to Jim. There are some Greeks that want to see you, Jesus. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, 
Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Okay, pass it. Now turn to me. He said, <laughs> The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. All right. Y'all may sit down now. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to play two parts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the Greek that just heard from Philip. And then I'm going to play Philip, okay? So, Philip just said to Randy the Greek, which if you want to make any bets on football teams, I'm really good at it. <laughs> Only you would get that. Only you. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you. I knew I had one. <laughs> and so... <clears throat> He just said to me, Verily, verily, I send to you, except corner wheat fall on the ground and die. So I'm looking at Philip and I go, What? I just I just want to see him. You know, I just I just like to see Jesus. I just like to see him. And so, you know, did was there anything else he said? Yeah, he said a lot, actually, all the way down to verse uh, 30. <laughs> all the way down. Um, well, tell me, tell me what else he said other than this thing about this agricultural issue. Well, I couldn't remember it all. And it was getting long, so I just decided <laughs> to come and tell you the first part because that seemed to be the part he was really talking to you about. So you, you're a follower of his, what do you make of it? What, is, what does he mean? It says, this is his answer to me that I would like to see Jesus. It's Greek to me. <laughs> All right, so that takes us to That takes us to the question of what is really going on here? <clears throat> and that's important. What is really going on here? Because Jesus is, you know, he is, you know, he's the one that people are seeking. He's the one. So you would expect the one who wants to be found, the one who men are seeking to say the things that would be necessary for them to make contact, amen? And more than make contact, but to give them something that would inspire them maybe or draw them or something like that, <clears throat> okay? You agree with that? Do you agree with that within the Christian church? <laughs> that this is what we're trying to do, inspire people, get people, draw them to uh, the wording here is Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. And I will tell you that Jesus' response <clears throat> is a response uh, not to Greeks that want to get closer or this or that. It is a response based on their wording saying, sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. All right, so our class has been about the Christ life and the crucified life. <clears throat> there are several different ways that you can look at those things. Some people would just all wrap that up in the word Jesus, but Jesus won't do that. And in fact, I can go through many, many major areas of scripture that use the name Jesus and in the gospels that, or even in the um, epistles. And when 
it is addressed as Jesus, he immediately begins to move into an explanation of something that is not just a name. So let's, let's identify that first. Jesus was a name that was given to him at his birth on this earth, right? Okay. Um, and, <clears throat> but he had an existence long before that earth was ever created. So when people now are coming to him, and there's, there's uh, let's say you could say titles, there is names, and then there is that which is the very substance and essence of the being that we know as God. But even the, even the name God is really more like a name or a title. It doesn't, it, within itself, it does not express who he is, okay? So, <clears throat> Jesus is, is not, I mean, because I tried to do the little skit thing here to show you how utterly ridiculous it, it says, and Jesus answered, and all that came up, how utterly ridiculous his answer is if that's really an answer, if that's an answer to, you know, uh, like we want to get closer to you or whatever. But if you understand his response in relationship to we want to see Jesus, then he's going to address that based on eternally who he is instead of temporally in the earth who he is, who he is known by only titles, or only a name that was slapped on. Every one of us had the name that you carry was slapped on you, and uh, maybe that's not a good word, but it was put on you when, when you were, you know, first born, you know. And it's stuck with you, but that name does not truly tell us who you are, right? You know. <clears throat> so Jesus is responding to that and here's and here's the the assurance that i can tell you again is that i have followed this out in so many places in the scriptures where it uses the name jesus and in the ones that i've been able to study so far he immediately or the scriptures either paul or whoever immediately began to fall into the category of what Jesus said as an answer. This is my answer. You want to see Jesus? Well, you can't see a name. But if you want to see who this Jesus is, that always was and always will be, even though his name will forever be Jesus now because that's a name but it's still, still just a name just like Lord is a title you know yes he has position and power but the name Lord is just a title that most people particularly within Christianity you see most people within Christianity <clears throat> are just saying Lord <clears throat> well let's use uh, Peter as a good example of that you know in Matthew 16, um, Jesus says, well, see, this is, <laughs> no matter where I go. Matthew 16, who do men say I am? And so Peter says, you know, or who do men say that I am? Well, this one says that you're John the Baptist and this is, you're one of the prophets. That is not knowing him. That is not really knowing him. So Jesus says, who do you say I am? <clears throat> and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, so there is, there is a reality in these titles up here, the Christ life and the crucified life, that they are both the same thing. 
Now our minds may have, and depending on the individual, may have said, well, the Christ life is either the, the life Jesus lived when he walked the earth, or maybe we're more advanced or whatever, and we say, well, it's Christ within us. <clears throat> um, some may even say uh, it's the one that's seated at the right hand of God. Okay, But the word Christ is the word Messiah. And I want, I'm, my point is not to go into all of that right now because it's very detailed. But in truth, these two things can express the same exact thing, the same exact person. So Jesus says, who do you say? And he said, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. So what does Jesus do? He immediately begins to talk about his death. Well, since you know me, right? Well, since you know me, um, and from that day forward, he began to talk about his death. And he began to describe it. Well, men shall, I shall be hated of men, and I shall be, you know, beaten and abused and this and that. And, um, and Peter stops him halfway through and says, not so, Lord. That's why I went to those scriptures in the first place. I wasn't planning on going there. Not so, Lord. You can call him Lord. Many call me, call, save to me, Lord, Lord, and do not. Okay, because the things that he wants done are not things. The things he wants done is that we be conformed to his image, that we be brought into the very heart of God and this reality, this eternal reality that was, folks, it was, it was settled before the world was. It was settled, or at least it was settled before man was. At least we have the scriptures that vouch for that. And that is up to day six, before it was the, the things of that took place, he said, he, them, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our own image after our likeness. Okay? He didn't say, let us make man for God's sake. We need somebody to, to tend the garden, you know, or some dumb thing like that, you know. Um, he had something in his heart. And, and, you know, we all know those scriptures. I mean, it's, that's great. It's wonderful that we know scriptures. But the Pharisees knew scriptures. And I'm not calling you a bunch of Pharisees, at least not this side of the room. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. There's more over here, so this side of the room. But, but they did, and they didn't know God's heart Therefore, they couldn't recognize him in the flesh. You say, well, you know, well, the artists of that day did because when they painted him, they put a halo on him. You know, there's Jesus. See the halo? What was it? What would make someone be able to identify God in the flesh or God in your flesh? Well, it would be a certain essence, a certain nature, a certain way, one that was consistent, one that didn't glorify itself, one that, didn't, that, that did glorify God, but all Christians glorify God in their minds, even, even while they're trying to glorify themselves. Lord, I come to you and I give you all the glory you know, help me on my job and make me a, you know, really rich person. And, you know, and every ounce of that, folks, is the exact opposite of help me to get low that you might be lifted up, you know. I mean, look at Jesus' word in John 12, 24. He said, if I be lifted up from this earth. And then he says, this spoke he of the manner of death that he should die, see. Now is the hour, and when those same verses that we read, now is the Son of Man glorified, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. You, you see what I'm saying? He, his words are strange to us because we're strange. We are a fallen creature. And if we're born again, 
Our mind hadn't been renewed. We haven't had the circumcision of the heart. That's still a process. That's still God's working on all of that within us. So how do we, how do we identify that in others? How do we identify that in us? We have to know essence. We have to know nature, and we have to understand consistency, and we have to, we have to, um, we have to pursue the Lord in that manner. We have to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I mean, just about everything Jesus says is, 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 you know, this is the third person of the Trinity or the second person of the Trinity who has, you know, all power and, you know, equal with God. Remember Philippians? Who being equal with God thought it not a thing to be robbed of, to give it up. And, um, and he is constantly, you know, not, not my will. If you were in the garden and stood there with him and you heard him pray that, you would say, well, Lord, is this, is this really what you want? I mean, this is going to be really rough on you. I mean, is this what, you know, are you, I mean, say that to some other people. This is really going to be rough. Is this what you want? He could turn to that person and say, look, it's not a circumstantial thing. It's not a circumstantial thing. In all circumstances, I want the Father glorified. And I want to do that by me decreasing and him increasing. I want to do that. See, he could say, I have, there are several methods I could use to glorify the Father. One is, I could ask the Father to glorify me and therefore it, he would get greater glory because I have so much power and glory, which is totally not the way he operates. <laughs> That's the world. That's the way carnal Christians think. <clears throat> or, I want to glorify him by showing his nature back to him in the worst or the best. What did Paul say? That Christ may be magnified in my mortal body, whether by life or by death. See, that's, folks, that makes it totally uncircumstantial. Do you see that? I mean, if it's whether by life or death, if it's, it doesn't, there is no circumstance that changes the desire of the heart that someone else, in this case, the son lifting up the father, that someone else would be lifted higher or that someone else's will or desire um, would be blessed. Can I say it like that? would be blessed at, at, at the cost of your own self, at, at the cost of your own self, and it not hurt at the cost of your own self, and it not hurt. When I say it not hurt, I don't mean Jesus didn't feel the nail scars, but he did every ounce of that for the Father to glorify God. Now, now is the Son of Mine glorified. I get to go the lowest that I've been so far on the planet. And we would say, that's not, that's not glorified. That's, that, you know, we have a word for that. Loser, you know. You're a loser. No. Paul said, I count all things lost just so I'd be a loser. No, he didn't. <laughs> Stop it. Don't go quoting that. <laughs> he said, I counted all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge, for the increase of the reality. Excellent knowledge. Not this religious, you know, Acts Bible School trash. <laughs> Unless it is the excellent knowledge. Amen. Come on, if it is, then... <clears throat> let's pursue it. But if it's not, let's all agree right now that the Lord shut down the church and the Bible school 
and mean it if it's not going to be there? What's the point? I mean, what is the point? If, especially if we're claiming, you know, one thing. And I'm not, that's not my point of what I'm sharing tonight. But I, I am saying, you know, Jesus, his, you know, when he said, not my will, but thine be done, he may not have even understood the extreme of where that would go. He didn't know the, the uh, I mean, in foreknowledge, I think he gave up his foreknowledge in that sense to walk as a man. So, so it's kind of, you know, but he knows the Father. And that's really the issue. That's the one issue. That's the one issue. He knows the Father, and he, and he wants the Father glorified, and he believes in the wording that he used there um, that now I'm really going to be glorified. And, in, and you read this in John 17, and he'll say that I, that I may have the glory or that they may have the glory that we had together before the foundation of the world. He, there is no glory in, in winning all the time. That's the only way I know how to say it, you know, um, unless it's an earthly glory. Now, you look at me and you say, well, are you saying you don't want the cowboys to win? Yes, I do want them to be. But there can't be a glorying, and you know, let's face it, in football, there's a lot of glorying and stuff like that. It, 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 you choose the one you want, and you like them, and you stick with them, whether it feels good or not, or whether they win or not. If they play a good game but lose, you say they played a good game but lost. If they play a lousy game, you say they played a lousy game. <laughs> you know, it's called being real, you know, not living in fantasy land. But, it, but, but that's so low compared to even the, the heart and the nature and the essence that, that is the Lord. <clears throat> and, you know, we, we, can look at, we can look at the Apostle Paul and we go, I mean, I have recently. I mean, I've just, I've been in the scriptures a lot, and of course I have with all the sharing that I've been doing. And, we, and I just looking at him and going, my Lord, this man <laughs> knew Jesus, he knew God, he knew the Father, he knew the Holy Spirit. He's the one who introduced almost all of that to us, you know. And if that's from me, I'm busy. And so uh, I, I look at that and I go, you know, how in the world could one man be the repository of so much? And the answer that comes to me is, he got more low than you ever thought about. Yeah. You know, how do you, how did he become the greatest missionary? I mean, look at he he basically reached the known world of his time. Well, he believed in Jesus, who said, "If I be lifted up on the cross, I'll draw all men unto me." But if you just lift up the cross, or you lift up Jesus of Nazareth, people may be drawn to you, but they won't be drawn to him. And that's, that's huge. That's huge, you know. And, and how many ministries, and again, you all know when I say it, and I have to say it a lot recently, but I, am not, I have no desire to put down other churches or whatever. But... When you talk about lifting up Christ above everything else, it's a crucified Christ. You understand? It's a crucified Christ. And, you know, it can't, and I'm not, I'm not you know, um, suggesting that we're doing this, but if you are, then just get real with the Lord and say, I don't, I don't want any more of deeper life truth or deep teaching. Um, I don't want to know the mysteries that others know. I want to know the Lord, and I want him formed in me, and I want him formed in me in a way that, 
that it'll really be him instead of, you know, man's interpretation. The interpretation of Christ never saved anybody. Amen. The interpretation of Christ never saved anybody. Jesus saves. And the interpretation of Christ has no power. But Jesus is the power. Christ crucified is the power and is the wisdom of God. First Corinthians, the first chapter. So, so he begins here and he says, um, Let's see, maybe I should make sure I read up here. So these guys came up to worship at the feast. Okay, that sounds very close to we came to worship at his feet. <laughs> um, last year at Thanksgiving, we had a wonderful, incredible, incredible time in the Lord. I've been involved in conferences my first year in Bible school. And, and it, it was in my heart and in my estimation the best one we'd ever had. But I believe that we came to worship at his feet, as it were. We came, and we didn't want to get high. We wanted to get low. And we didn't want to make any issue the issue. We just wanted the Lord. We wanted the Lord and we wanted him glorified. And, and, and it wasn't even about, Lord, change me and get in an environment of your presence so that you'll move and do stuff for me. It was that you may be glorified, that our hearts are totally set on you apart from ourselves. Apart from ourselves. We don't want to come worship, and it was Thanksgiving. We didn't want to come worship at the feast. We wanted to worship at his feet. And this year the Lord has given me a slightly different theme. But it's, it's more dear. It's more dear. And, and I, I think Sometimes we, we think, well, if we come together, there'll just be this wonderful thing that happens. But you see, I honestly believe this, and I believe it with all my heart, that he's not real crazy about us not seeking his heart or seeking at his feet uh, for most of the year. But then we sort of get prepped, you know, Come on, Randy. Come on, Kelly. Come on, Debbie. Come on. Let's get everybody prepped uh, for what's coming. And, I, and I'm happy to say, in my heart, I believe that basically we have a lot of people here that are already prepped and on Skype with us already. Seriously. I'm, I'm not, you know I'm not a flatterer. Most of you know, know me. <laughs> I wouldn't say this. This would be like blasphemy to me to say that if I didn't really believe that. I realize that most pastors and preachers and whatever, they say stuff like that to get everybody pumped up. I, I think that you are beyond pumped up. I think that many of you are broken and hungry and love him and drawn without any words and preparations other than the things that have to be said. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of the said and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. So you see desire here. You see desire, but it is, you know, and it's the it's the not just one Greek guy, it's several Greek people. And we have come up here and we've heard that maybe maybe what what if they heard that the that that Jesus is greater than the feast and we desire him and they say sir we would see Jesus and what if Jesus what if he is so desirous of something greater 
because we just we usually at gatherings and stuff like that we oh i want to I, I have a desire for the lord right but what if he has a desire what if he has a desire what if that's so big to him that jesus can't just fulfill their desire he has to release his desire that he be known not as whatever explanations have been given up to this point here's my explanation except a seed fall into the ground and die it's going to be alone but if it dies it'll bring forth much more of the same. We say much fruit. Well, it does. It is much fruit. But, I mean, if you have a, a pomegranate, uh, fruit from a pomegranate tree, well, what's it full of? Seeds. And if you take one of those seeds and you plant it and it grows and it gets big and brings forth fruit, what's the biggest thing it's going to bring forth? Seeds. Where is the life? Like an apple. Is it in the white part? Is it in the red part? <laughs> you know, maybe it'll keep our life alive. But it's life. It's life. It's in the seed. And Jesus is saying, I don't want you just partaking of my fruit. The white part or the red part. I want you to understand the process. Um, some of you remember the old saying, you know, you don't teach a man, you don't give a man a fish, you teach him how to fish. Well, Jesus doesn't teach the cross. He gives us a way that we can be involved with it. Except a seed fall into the ground and die, to, uh, it, uh, it'll abide alone, alone, alone. Does that ring any bells in any hearts from the very beginning? I mean, Adam looked and he saw, and God looked and saw there was no counterpart for man. There was, you know, that for every creature. And he said, God said, who is that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have to see, this isn't, Jesus didn't say, hey, I think I'll go die and we'll, you know, we'll do some stuff. You know, and they're like, go ahead. You know, this is, this is their Godhead. This is the Trinity. This is their heart. This is something that's important. And you see all of the, the seeds of that reality early on, before sin, before the devil, before, before the devil shows up, before sin has showed up, let us make man in our image. Um, it is not good that man be alone. And he's, he sent his son so that he might have a counterpart, so that he might have one after his kind, so that he might have the wife of the lamb. And you see it wrapped up in the book of Revelation, the wife of the lamb. It didn't say the, the best friend of Jesus. And these things have to move us. They have to. It's not teaching. It's not. It's not even clarity of teaching. Something, something of the spirit of it has to one day hit us so hard that we just go, "This is, this is it. This is it. This is it." My God, I can't just do the Christian thing in the earth anymore. And and again. Do it out there. If you're called to it, go do it. But I believe that there are those who have a heart that the Lord is wanting to draw into himself, not just sit them down 12 and go, okay, here's the deal. Here's how I did it. Here's how you'll do it. No. It's just that he might, as Paul said in Ephesians that he might fill all things, fill my motives, 
Fill the way I see. Fill the way I think. Fill the way my heart beats. Jesus answering a simple question, a simple question. And he just cannot say, okay, I'll just, I'll just bless you. Come see me. I'll give you a hug. You know what I'm saying? He's saying, I need some after my kind. I need something more from you. I need something of me, out from me, part of me. And, I, and he's saying, and I know that the only way I'll ever get that is that I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to die. And I'm willing to do it. But Lord, like, like, like Peter to Jesus, not so, Lord. No, this shall not be to you. You know, all this stuff talking about the cross and everything that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 16, this shall not be to you. And Jesus says to him, Peter, get behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of men and not the things that be of God. Peter's going, okay, what's up with that? Well, I'll tell you what's up with it. The same thing that's up with him here and in so many places. It is just the way he thinks. It's why he came. It is, it is, he's consumed with that. All we see is the miracles, and I love the miracles, and I thank God, and I'm believing for one if that's what the Lord wants right now. But that's all we see. How about we see the heart that just gives and gives and gives? You know? And I see him having to stop Peter from talking. Just stop talking, Peter. It sounds so right. Your, your compassion for me sounds so right. You sound like one of the best ministers around. But I have got to die, and I will die. And you, you will get in the midst of that because you're so out of tune with me and you're your mind is so far, you know, we're not talking about, you know, rank sin or whatever. We're, when we say so far, we mean so far in the way that he thinks within our Christian concepts that he was saying to him, it's so far from me that in really, you know, in one hour, you'll deny me three times. You, you will, but you won't do it to, you know, you could, you could say, well, you didn't do it a week ago, and you didn't do it a week ago, because the danger is you'll do it when the time of the cross comes. You, you won't be in tune with that. You're, you're going to be in tune with, well, we've got to, let's do this, let's help, let's, you know, what we call compassionate ministry. We're gonna, you know, oh yeah, praise God, we'll do this. And it'll bless them, and it'll bless the Lord. And the Lord sometimes is just saying, look, just let me deal with my people the way I want to, and trust me, and, you know, look, look to me. For example, in the situation that Jesus was talking about, it is the cross. <laughs> Don't cross me when I'm talking about the cross. <laughs> don't do it don't do it be with me how do I be with you well you're going to have to start by you know flushing your carnal mind I know I'm, I'm a bad man because <laughs> I use terminology that most people shouldn't do but that's the way I see it I see it just like that it's just like it's a stench in the nostrils of God. Okay, well, again, we're not talking about, well, the way we think is better. I'm talking about what he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
I'm talking about be renewed in the spirit of your mind because the spirit of your mind is off. Yeah, but I think, I think scriptures, I mean, you know, he said search the scriptures, but he said find me. He didn't say find ways to be Christian. Amen? Well, my heart is full. I just, I just am dealt with, I just, um, I desire to break past the, the cages that, the bars that hold my heart back from the Jesus that I really long for. And you say, well, you seem to really know him a lot. <laughs> it's not enough. I want him, you know? I want him. And if there's any portion of what I'm teaching that is not yet him, then I want him. What is, what, I'm, now I'm talking from my heart, what is the point, what would be the true point of me learning the terminology and everything and just talking and never me getting closer to the Lord or never bringing anyone else closer to the Lord and never really having any kind of an impact, just sailing through life, you know? Just putting it all on cruise control because it's, we, you know, because the church system allows it to stay alive instead of finding him. So, um, if I have offended anybody, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, and uh, we ask you to bless by your spirit the things that are important to you. And, Lord, whatever I've said that is off or not quite clear or not right on, you just remove that from anyone's heart so that they're, they don't have to wrestle with something like that, Father. But, Father, whatever really is flowing out from you, from your heart, then we need you to turn it up a notch. We need you to turn it up a notch. We need you to break us from our lackadaisical rest, resting in religion ways. So we ask it, but we make sure that we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. All right, some of you, that class is over. I'm going to